the government in Egypt, for example, initially the, the, the Brotherhood government tried to ride the tiger. But it very quickly discovered what a dangerous game that was. And so you saw within a day or two uh, a, an about face with the government starting to try and tamp down the protests um, and to limit the violence. Um, and I, here I want to make a contrast between what happened this time and what happened in 2006 when you had widespread protests across the Muslim world against the Prophet Muhammad cartoons. That was still in the age of the autocrats and once the fires got lit they burned for days and days. Here, by about day two, you saw this massive upswelling of counter protests and these very interesting incidents in Libya and Egypt and in others of ordinary Egyptians and, and Tunisians and, Egypt and Libyans getting up and saying, hold on a second, we are angry about, these, uh, about this video, but these violent protests, this is not us, and this is not being done in our name. And you didn't see that in 2006. And that's, I think, a big sign of, uh, of progress. We still don't know what's going to happen with the Arab Spring, but we are going to be surprised and we're going to continue being surprised. We know that the enervating and brutal days of the Arab uh, dictatorships are over. We know that there's now a battle raging for the soul of the Arab world between the Salafis and between the moderizers. And whether we get a new Islamist age or something in some of these countries that looks more like the Turkish model remains to be seen. Like Zhu Enlai famously said about the French Revolution, uh, it's still too soon to say. Um, so what does this mean for us? What's the headline? Um, here I, 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 I'm reminded of a joke that Shimon Peres, now the president of Israel, liked to make about the Middle East peace process. He would say, ask me how the peace process is going in one word, and I'll say, good. Ask me how it's going in two words, and I'll say, not good. I would invert that here. The big headline for the Arab Spring, at least today, is not good. But the underlying story, in one word, is good, or at least pretty good. Avoid thinking in monolithic terms. You know, there's, there's, a, lot of, there's a lot of buzz to be created by uh, headlines like Islam versus the West, the West versus Iran, Shia versus Sunni. But you know, from my perspective, looking at the human rights issues on the ground, Frequently, these sorts of monolithic frameworks of uh, 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 binary ways of thinking, one versus the other, obscure more than they illuminate. And that there are significant developments on the ground across multiple different societies with different trajectories that, that get hidden if we think in those big terms. Approach all of the challenges that are being faced across the Middle East and North Africa from a uh, a universal perspective of human rights. And of course, it's no surprise that the Amnesty International person is going to say that. Uh, but what I mean by that is that whether one is criticizing the horrendous atrocities, the war crimes, the crimes against humanity in Syria, or the, uh, the, the terrible repression in Iran, both, both countries, both governments, of course, happening to be adversaries of the US government, it's also important to be even-handed and equally critical of human rights violations in those countries that are, whose governments are allied with the United States, whether it's Saudi Arabia, the, the government of Bahrain, or even the Israeli government and its treatment of Palestinians in the West Bank and in Gaza, for example. And it's through this sort of a universal approach that we can actually move the needle in a direction that those of us who are engaged in public policy and international affairs can be happy about, which is the universal application of human rights, regardless of who's in power, regardless of who's not in power, regardless of what government is trying to make concessions to what competitive faction that's at their heels in the, the new democratic environments that some of these countries face. It's important to have a, a, a approach US foreign policy with a, a healthy and skeptical uh, posture of engagement. And what I mean by that is that right now, even as our, some of our own government officials are highly critical of the, the terrible atrocities that are being perpetrated in Syria, for example. Uh, more of a free pass is sometimes being given to the US allies that are, being engage, that are engaging in similar but perhaps much lower levels of repression. Right now, there's a man by the name of Nabil Rajab, who is a Bahraini, who was first put in prison for tweeting criticism of the Bahraini prime minister. Then that was dropped, but then given three years in prison uh, because he had put, uh, participated in three different peaceful protests. These are examples where those of us who are concerned and engaged citizens uh, who want to be engaged in the political process and push for positive changes across the region need to make sure that from our perch, whatever our perch is, that we are holding the governments that we have the most access to 
accountable to the same standards that we want to see uh, emerge and replicated across the Middle East and North Africa so that the governments that we are most directly engaged with, whether that's the U.S. government for those who are based in the U.S. or other governments uh, in other parts of the world, are playing the best role possible vis-a-vis -vis their power and their interests and their assets. Um, on the question of, of Syria, I think we should stay out. Um, I'm, I appreciate the benefits of getting rid of the Assad regime, which is a foul, miserable regime. Uh, nothing, nothing good to say about it or the father of the current ruler. Miserable, miserable, miserable. Uh, on the other hand, uh, I worry about the Islamists uh, taking over in Syria, and I worry about even more trouble. And I see that there's certain benefits to having, uh, again, looking at it not from a humanitarian point of view, but from a strategic point of view. Can you, ever, can you view. ever put Syria back to where it was if you no, don't, don't get rid of Assad? And, and if not, then what should the United States I don't want to help Assad be? by any stretch of imagination. But I also am not entirely enthusiastic. I'm not enthusiastic about helping the rebels. By the way, the rebels had their own demonstrations against us a couple of days ago uh, because of the uh, movie. Um, we, ha we don't have a dog in this fight. And I, you know, there's nothing in the United States Constitution that says we have to be engaged in every single foreign uh, problem. There's sometimes we can just sit it out. We had a visit um, uh, two weeks ago from uh, eight young uh, Libyan journalists um, uh, at, at World Policy, and, and they were quite. It was quite fascinating. It was before the Benghazi um, uh, incident, of course, took place. And and what they told us was that uh, they found that post Gaddafi, uh, their, their their reporting environment, their ability to function. Um, in, on behalf of their people and, and report on behalf of their people had never been uh, in, their, in their lifetime um, more free and more uh, liberal. At the same time, they also did not have a very good sense of where their country or their whole region was going. And that disturbed them more than probably anything else. So uh, perhaps we can talk a little bit about that. Like, how do these people really see where they're going and how is that likely to affect the, you know, our relationships with, um, with, with these countries? If you talk to um, young uh, Islamic uh, radicals or, or just the, the profoundly devout, uh, they feel pretty good because they feel like their people are empowered for the first time ever. If you talk to many of the women and the moderates um, who are in Tahrir Square, they're intensely anxious and they have reason to be anxious. Um, the whether you know the great fear about Islamists in power was would that it, it was that it would mean uh, one man one vote one time and um, I think that 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 fear is still very much in the forefront of the um, the the Democrats and the secularists or the pluralists who who man the barricades at the beginning of the protests um, the the signs so far are equivocal I would say in Tunisia uh, and especially in Libya they're surprisingly good I would say in Egypt they're much more mixed I disagree with you entirely and I I, don't, I think it's totally unacceptable that um, that they allowed our embassy to be stormed which they did and they could have stopped it and um, I also, I, and I don't understand your remarks about Libya too, because it's fairly clear now that uh, that, that Al Qaeda was involved in the attack on the embassy, and that it was a planned attack. It wasn't just, oh gee, you know, a few uh, elements here. So it, it seems to be a guy who got out of Guantanamo, who was a member of Al Qaeda, and led the attack, and they came to to our embassy heav heavily armed. Right. And so, I mean, I think it's actually really, from the American point of view, unacceptable. What's going to happen if Iran gets the bomb? Does, does Saudi Arabia then get yes. the bomb, right? And, and, and the answer was A.Q. Khan. You know, we pick up the phone, we call Pakistan, and there are six bombs, uh, you know, that we have uh, at our disposal mm -hmm. and within uh, three weeks. Daniel, what do you, how, do, how do you see that uh, playing out? I mean, you're, you're very interested in that, in that part of the equation, I think. I think the prospect of the nuclearization of the Middle East is very high should the Iranians get nuclear weapons. And uh, that is one of the many reasons why we don't want the uh, Iranians to get nuclear weapons. And um, we shall see in the next few months whether the Iranians will get weapons or not. Yeah, Daniel, like, what do you think the likelihood is of um, Iran getting the bomb? Or the Israeli striking. Or the Israeli striking. <laughs> this is a $64 <laughs> question. My, my inclination is to say that the Iranians will not get it. Something is going to happen that will prevent them. We haven't arrived at any solutions, and, and this is one of the great values of this, uh, of the Blue and Summit, is, is to try to arrive at some kind of potentially some policy solution, some, some, something we can tell our leaders that they should be doing. Uh, Lally, you, you, you have lots of policy ideas very often. Um, 
you just come back from a place with, that relies heavily on, on what the United States thinks. Um, what, what should we be saying? Well, I think that's a very good question, and I'm afraid that I would have to, to, to answer, and I don't know if Daniel agrees with me, that, that all bets are off until the election, and uh, maybe on both sides of the aisle, not just on Obama's side, but clearly on Obama's side, the Syria issue is dead until the election, as far as I can see. And Romney certainly. And then what happens after that? And then I would more or less agree with, with uh, Daniel, the, the, or he didn't say exactly, but I would assume he agreed. The biggest issue in the Middle East really is what is going to happen to Iran's nuclear weapon. Is it going to be allowed to get the nuclear weapon? Is the President of the United States going to allow it to get a nuclear weapon? Is anybody on, going to not be, able to, not be able to prevent it from getting a nuclear weapon? Yes. The United States could definitely prevent Iran from getting a nuclear weapon. Israel can strike. Israel can strike some of the program, but in order to, as I understand it at least from talking to experts there and here, in order to strike underground where the um, enriched uranium centrifuges are hidden, um, you really need the buster bunkers that belong to the U.S., so you'd really need a joint operation. And I believe really the United States would have to be involved in that, and so it's in the end a, a United States decision, I believe, although Israel could of course strike first, and I defer to Daniel. Either can strike. Uh, both can just delay it. The Iranians have the skills and the materiel to recreate the program. So anything one does only delays it. Presumably the US attack would delay it longer, maybe much longer than an Israeli attack. But an attack in itself would be such a major event, mm -hmm. it would have so many repercussions uh, that it, it would change the, the, the dynamics. 